Alright, this week we're going to be learning about interactive computing with IPython and Jupyter. Today I'm going to start Jupyter Lab. You can also use Jupyter Notebook. If I start Jupyter Lab in my terminal by typing Jupyter Lab, and I give the path if you want to, and that starts the Jupyter Lab server. So you can see Jupyter Lab is loading and gives me this UI where I have a typical file menu in my browser, um, and then I'll go to this file browser. So it's launcher, lets me create new notebooks or terminals or other files. And I can also browse files over here, and I'm going to open this ipython.ipynb. So this is a notebook file. A Jupyter Notebook is a document containing cells. There are a couple kinds of cells. There's markdown cells. So if I double click on this, I have the Jupyter logo and the heading. This is in a syntax called markdown, which is shorthand for HTML. You can have images, and it can have, uh, with dollar signs, it can have LaTeX, and it can have links and formatting, and press Shift Enter to render that cell as HTML. But it can also have cells that are um, have some code in them. So here I have a bit of code that actually shows me the content of the notebook that we're looking at. So you can see that the notebook file, this ipython.ipynb, is actually a text file in a format called JSON, and most of the notebook is this list of cells. And each cell is a dictionary that has a type, and the content of the cell and other things. So a notebook contains kind of rich text in the form of markdown and input, so code like you would have might have in a script, but the big difference is that it also includes output. So this output is actually saved in the notebook document itself. And this enables things like NB Viewer, which is a service that takes notebooks and renders them online for people to view, and NB Convert, which takes notebooks and can convert them to other things like blog posts and things like that. So for the interactive part, um, the main thing that IPython gets you, so IPython provides what's called a kernel for Jupyter. So when you have this uh, code cell, um, and then you press uh, Shift Enter, Control Enter to execute it, Jupyter sends that text, that code as text, to something it calls the kernel, which is responsible for interpreting that text um, and doing something and producing the output. So here you can see I'm writing, running a notebook with Python 3. You can run Jupyter with many different languages, and the kernel is what's responsible for interpreting that code. So here I have some code. I press Shift Enter to run it, and that code prints, and then I, IPython captures that output and sends it back to the notebook. Output is captured and relayed as it's produced. So you can see you can have a long running cell but get intermediate output as it's being produced. And a critical aspect of IPython and Jupyter in general is that the kernel is a long running process. So each notebook document gets a kernel, and that is a persistent namespace where uh, code and variables exist. So here I define the variable i, and in the next cell I can look at what i is. So a lot of what we do in IPython is to improve you know, the process of figuring out what code we want to write. So that's usually why we have an interactive session, is where we have you know a text editor open, we're writing some code, and then we have an interactive session, whether it's a notebook or terminal IPython, to do some poking around and prototyping to figure out what it is we write, want to write in the module. So question mark is the first uh, stop in the additions. So IPython extends the Python language to add some features to make interactive computing a little bit more convenient. And one of those is question mark. So if you have any kind of symbol, any object that you have imported, and you put a question mark on it, it gets information about that to report. So here, named tuple is a constructor for a type. So we get the signature, so we can see how to call it, and then if that's not enough information, the doc string might give us examples or point to other uh, other useful functions, and IPython shows us that with question mark. If that's not enough information, uh, you can add an extra question mark, so two question marks. In addition to that, instead of the doc string, it grabs the actual source code. So for the counter class, we can actually see that counter is a subclass of a dictionary, and we can actually see the source code. So this is useful if, you know, the the signature or doc string don't give you the information you want, or maybe it's not behaving the way you expect, the, getting the source code can help you know, see what's the actual code that's being executed. So now I can instantiate one of these counters, and I can inspect the most common method with the question mark. Let's see, what does most common do? It takes one, ar one optional argument, n, um, and gives you a list of the n most common elements and their counts. So now I can call that method and give, get the two most common elements. See, A is the most common with five counts, B is the second most common with four. So the next interactive feature is called tab completion. So anywhere you put the cursor when you're in the middle of typing, you can press tab, and IPython will give you a list of what it thinks are valid symbols to put there. And as you type, it'll find those options. And um, then you can press enter to select. Tab completion is nice because it not only save, can save you time, but it can also save you typos, right? Because all those symbols are valid, so if you use tab completion to type things out, it can help avoid typos. Anytime you run a command with IPython, IPython keeps track of that and stores it in your history. So you can see like what were um, the first five lines 
that I executed in this session and show me the line numbers. But we can also do a search. So dash G is for a glob search and U is show me only the unique items. So let's say I wanna do something with a NumPy convolution. Um, and I know I use uh, NumPy convolve to do that. I know I've done it in the past, but I don't remember exactly how to call it. I can search my history and say, when was the last time I used convolve? Maybe is this enough information for me to remember how to use it from my own use in the past? So the next thing that IPython does is adding access to the underlying operating system. So I can open, there's my file.py here. Um, I have a link to that. So I can open that in another editor. I can drag it over so I can see it side by side. If I wanna look at that file, um, just do a quick peek. I can do exclamation point or bang. Um, and then cat is a system call to show the content of the file. So any command, uh, any line starting with uh, exclamation point is as if you typed it in a terminal. So interacting with the, Python has lots of ways to interact with the OS and file system. So for instance, if you want to get the current working directory, we need import the OS module and then call the os.getcwd function and then print the result. Or if we want to see a list of files, I can import the subprocess module, start a subprocess, capture the output, collect the output, and then print the output. That's a little bit tedious because often you're changing directories and, and things uh, in an interactive session and you just want to kind of quickly see where you are. Um, so if you just do um, exclamation point pwd, that's a little bit more convenient way to say where am I or ls. These shell escapes uh, eliminate one of the major, uh, one of the downsides of shifting to Python for an interactive session is that you still get all the convenience of a shell is only an exclamation point away. And you can store the output of these commands in a Python variable. And when you've got Python variables, you can build shell commands just like you would in bash. Um, if you create a variable in Python, you can put that in the line with dollar sign like you would with bash, or you can do fancier things. If you um, use braces, you can have a little Python expression in here, and that will be evaluated before replacing it with a string. So the next and perhaps biggest thing that IPython adds to the Python language is something called magics. So when a line starts with percent um, and then a string, that's the name of the magic, and then the rest of that line is passed to that magic just as a string. So in this case, time it takes a snippet of Python code and measures how long it takes. If you start a cell with two percents and a name, that's what's called a cell magic. So that instead of passing the rest of the line, it's passing the rest of the cell, just the entire cell to time it. And these can be anything. So here the HTML magic takes a, a snippet of HTML code. It doesn't need to be Python code and then passes that to create some HTML output to display. So a lot of what IPython's about is making things that are useful interactively a bit more convenient to do kind of really quickly. So time it, the time it module in Python is a really nice tool for measuring how long something takes, but it takes a lot of input, say like repeat this seven times, do a thousand samples, all that. And in order to pick an IPython's all about doing things quickly and interactively. And one of the most important things in time it is we want to get a result in kind of uh, what we might call an interactive time scale. So it doesn't, we don't want it to take more than a few seconds. So here I'm going to just measure how long it takes to create a bunch of lists from 10 to a million elements. And critically, what IPython is going to do is it's going to run it enough times to get a reasonable result, right? You want to, you want to, you always want to run something as many times as possible to kind of smooth out the statistical noise, but you don't want it to take 10 minutes. So what IPython does, it measures how long it takes to run it once, and then it picks a number of runs so that it finishes in a few seconds. Here in this case, it's running in between five and 10 seconds. So you can see when we had, we're creating 10 elements, it ran it a million times, and when you're creating a, running a million elements, it ran it 10 times. And if we run something that takes a full second, uh, then it's only gonna run it one time, right? So this is IPython saving you from having to think before you run the code, say, how long does this take? But you, you kind of have to know approximately how long it takes before you pick how many re repetitions. And IPython automates that step for you because it knows when you run this measurement in IPython, you want to get that result in a, in a short amount of time. And then you can put question mark on magics to see how you get all the arguments and all the options for storing those in, in variables, things like that. And as we saw with the HTML magic, it can be anything. So here we can use the bash magic to write, a, to have a short bash script, and we can also uh, create temporary files. So here, write file takes a file name on the line, and then the rest of the file is written uh, to that file. And then there's also finally a magic called ls magic which gives you a report on all of the magics. So here, ls magic gives you all the line magics we have. We have auto magic, auto call, and all these things, and all the cell magics. So here we can see time, time it, debug. And say, oh, we're interested in the capture magic. Let's say we're interested in the capture cell magic. Double percent, capture. 
and question mark and see what is it the capture does. So capture takes a cell, executes it, and captures the output and variables for use later. That's all for this video. The next one we're going to talk about some interactive debugging.